It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness the sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. So what's good about Good Friday? You know, each one of us will have a story about the end of our lives. And the Bible tells us how Jesus' life ended. And it ended on a Friday, on a cross, on a hill. And the Christian calendar, it calls that day Good Friday. But if you look on the street level, if you look at what we read just now, if you think about it from the perspective of his friends and his disciples, you, you have to ask the question, but is it really good that Friday? And in that story, there's so much pain, there's so much suffering. There's emotional pain, there's physical pain, there's spiritual pain that Jesus is experiencing. And you know, honestly, when I think about what's happening in Hungary today, I think about so much pain and suffering that people are experiencing. And I would imagine that if I could sit down with each one of you over a cup of coffee, each one of you could share with me an experience a difficult experience, a pain, or a suffering that you've experienced in this last period of time. And you'd call that anything but good. So what's good about Good Friday? And you know, that's a fair question because as we look at these final hours of Jesus, it's hard to find something really good to talk about. And so I just want to think about those final hours. Think about him and his life. I think about Judas, one of his trusted friends that he had put in charge of the treasury of his group of disciples. And he betrays him and he sells him for 30 pieces of silver. And then when the Roman soldiers come from that betrayal and they find Jesus in the garden with his other, other disciples, he's abandoned by his friends. All of them run away and leave him all alone. And then you have this inner circle trusted disciple named Peter. And Peter had been with Jesus for three years and they had eaten together and they'd traveled together and, and Jesus had healed Peter's mother-in-law and they'd shared stories and ministered together. And, and at the moment that Jesus needed Peter the most, Peter denied Jesus three times in the courtyard of the high priest. What's good about Good Friday? And then Jesus, he becomes the object of this, this kind of political back and forth, pull and take between the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders, and the Roman government found in Pontius Pilate. And there's really pure self-interest that's going on in this battle over Jesus. Because the religious leaders, they want Jesus killed because he's interfering with their, with their power. But they can't do it because it's against the law. And so they need Rome to do it. And so they, they engage with Pilate and try to get Pilate to do it. And yet Pilate, representing Rome, he can't quite see the reason that Jesus should be put to death. He doesn't see it. He, he actually says he's an innocent man. And, and he doesn't see the need for him to be sentenced to capital punishment. But the religious leaders, they apply more pressure. They whip up the crowds. They intimidate Pilate. They talk about Caesar as king and how Jesus had said he was king. And so finally the pressure just gets too much for Pilate. And he orders Jesus to be crucified. What's so good about Good Friday? And then comes the seemingly worst of it all, crucifixion. And if you read through the four Gospels, you'll notice that the Gospel writers don't really go into great detail about the crucifixion. And why would that be? Well, it's because they all knew it. They'd all seen it. 
They'd seen the brutality of it. They'd seen it used by the Romans. But we know from history, we know detailed accounts of what happens in crucifixion. And so we know exactly what happened to Jesus. He was laid on a wooden cross as a person would be. And then they would take these, these nails, these iron thick nails, and they would, they would pierce them. They would hammer them through the person's hands. And then they would put their feet together and they would hammer them both through both feet. And then they would raise that cross vertical. And there that person would be left to die. And the person would actually die from asphyxiation because they would be constantly trying to lift themselves up to breathe and to maintain life. And that's how Jesus died. And you put that all together. And I say you're looking at that on the street level from a human perspective. And you ask the question, what's good about Good Friday? But if you step back from that day, if you step back from Friday, if you step back, not a week, if you step back, not a month, not a year, but if you step back and see the entire life of Jesus, in fact, if you step back and see a whole, uh, the whole story of humanity, if you look at it from that perspective, I think you'll begin to understand and begin to see what's so good about Good Friday. And so let me tell you, let me tell you one thing that's good about Good Friday. Well, it's good because Jesus suffered and died to become a ransom for many. Jesus suffered and died to become a ransom for many. And the gospel writer Mark, he talks about this in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. And he said, the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, in that statement, there's a hint of a plan. And did you hear it? Did you catch it? There's a hint of a plan because it says, Jesus, the Son of Man, came into the human story to give his life, Mark says. To give his life. Jesus voluntarily went to the cross on Good Friday. And that's so important for us to understand. He voluntarily went to the cross because when you hear the story that Tappy read, you almost imagine that Jesus is, is helpless, that Jesus is just being tossed back and forth by the powers that be, that he's totally out of control. But really, the opposite is actually true of what's taking place on that Friday. And there's a hint of it in the words of Jesus that she read in chapter 23 of the Gospel of Luke. And Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He's committing his spirit. It's not being taken away from him. He's committing it to his Father. And in fact, in John chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus said, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. And multiple times, Jesus, when he was with his band of 12 disciples, he was teaching them and he was reminding him of this day that would come, this Good Friday. And he would say, the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected. And he would tell them that over and over again. In fact, on his way to Jerusalem to meet that day, Good Friday, Jesus said, the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him, Mark 10.33. And then comes Mark 10.45, where even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so let's just be clear, what is a ransom? What's a ransom? A ransom is a payment that is made in order to secure the freedom of one held captive. A ransom is a payment that is made to secure the freedom of a person, someone that is held captive. And the payment that Jesus made, the, the ransom that he paid, it was his life. It was his very own life. And I love the way Peter 
Peter who ran away, Peter who betrayed him, later described that scene in 1 Peter chapter 1. And he said this, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but he was revealed in these last times for your sake. The payment of the ransom was his very own life. And you know, we're all held captive by our sin because we've all sinned against God and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And the Bible says that the wages of sin are death. And that means that there's judgment that's held over each one of us because of the sin problem that we have between us and our Creator. And in reading the Gospel story tonight from the Gospel of Luke, we heard something about this judgment because luke said that there's three hours of darkness that took place when jesus was hanging on the cross and it was from noon to three and then he also mentions that there was a tearing of the curtain of the temple that was torn in two and these are pictures of the judgment of god that's taking place the first one is a judgment over humanity the darkness that falls the sadness because the son of god is being crucified and the second is the judgment over Israel who rejected the Son, the Messiah, who came for them. And so this judgment is not something new, but it's something that's been seen in the Bible before. Because if we go to the Old Testament, if we go to the book of Exodus, and we look at the story of Moses and Pharaoh, we see judgment is enacted out there as well. God he enacted 10 plagues on the Egyptians because they would not let the people of Israel go free from their captivity. And what's interesting about those 10 plagues is the ninth and the 10th, because the ninth plague, it was the one of darkness. And it was a plague of darkness that took, over, that took place over a period of three days. And it was followed by the 10th plague. And what was the 10th plague? The 10th plague was the death of the firstborn sons of Egypt. And in Luke's gospel, we find three hours of darkness. And then we find the death of God's firstborn, Jesus Christ, on the cross. In Christ the firstborn son, he secured our ransom. And the Bible says because he did that, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And, and that's amazing good news on that Good Friday. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation, think about that, no criticism. No disapproval, no denunciation, none of that. And we ask the question, well, how can that be? And I want to ask the question, how, that, how can that be for you? And how can that be for me? And what does it mean to be in Christ that's talked about here? What does it mean to be the one who was captive and that yet Christ was the one who ransomed? How do I attain that? How do I get that? How do I experience that? And the answer is simple. It's simply by trusting and believing in Jesus. It's by trusting and believing in Jesus. It's to be in a personal relationship with Christ. You see, each one of us will have a story about the ending of our lives. And the question is, which way will our story go? Will it go? in a way that's being with Jesus? Or will it go in another way that's being eternally separated from Jesus? And the Gospel writer John made it very clear in John 3.16 when he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. 
and in its amazing promise. And God also gives us another promise in Romans 5, chapter 8, when he said, God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, he took the initiation. He took the initiative and he came toward us. And I want you to know that eternal life is this, as John stated, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And so Jesus was a real man who shed real blood. And Jesus came to be a substitute, to be a sacrifice. He was a ransom, but he was, he was dying on the cross in your place. And each one of us should, should be on that cross. Each one of us deserve eternal punishment. But Christ in his great love, his rescuing mission of ransom, he came for each one of us. And on this day, we want to proclaim that Christ loved us so much that he gave his life for us. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And if you've never experienced that, if, if, if you want that relationship with Jesus, will you bow your heads and pray with me now? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you came on a rescue mission. And even though this, this night that we think about your suffering sacrifice for us is dark and it's heavy, Lord, we thank you for the love that you showed for each one of us to take the entire weight of the sins of the world on your shoulders and to sacrifice and pay the penalty for our sins so that we might be forgiven and that we might live forever with our Savior. And if there's anybody out there this evening that, that desires that, that wants that, may they simply cry out and say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I recognize that I'm a sinner and I don't meet the standards of perfect. And I thank you for dying on the cross and I thank you, Lord, for loving me and I pray that you might come into my life, forgive me. I turn from my sins and make me the kind of person that you want me to be. And I ask and pray.